Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time we're going to talk about slow shutter speed panning. Slow shutter speed panning gives you a fun creative tool that allows you to add some more artistic abstract style photos to your portfolio while also giving you a way to keep shooting when the light is too low for the normal shutter speeds we tend to call on for action work. In fact, anytime my ISOs are too high and I'm facing an active bird or mammal, I start thinking about slow shutter speed panning. However, a few things have to fall into place for the best results. First, you have to have a proper subject moving in the right direction. Although you can use slow shutter speeds for wildlife coming at you, you know, from any angle, a true slow shutter speed panning shot is really when the animal is moving more or less parallel to your position. If the animal is coming towards you at an angle, it's often difficult to get a recognizable face or eye, and it's not really what we're referring to in this video as a panning shot. Of course, some shooters are happy with just an impression of an animal and not worried about a recognizable face or eye at all. So, as with all things artistic, what you like and how you get there may vary from someone else. Still, for a proper slow shutter speed panning shot, the idea is that you're panning with the animal to keep it sharp, especially in the face and eye area, while everything else is streaked and blurry, and the easiest way to do that is with the animal moving roughly parallel to your position. In addition to the subject moving the proper direction, you also need the right background. A plain background with no real detail won't give you any interesting streaking or really convey a sense of motion slash movement. Look for subjects with a busy, disturbed, even colorful background behind them for the best results. Avoid areas with little or no detail like clear skies or still water. Next, the tech stuff. Exposure mode. How I choose the exposure mode I use for slow shutter speed panning is pretty much the same as how I choose an exposure mode for normal panning. As with most of my wildlife work, I tend to favor manual with auto ISO, so I have complete control over both the shutter speed and f-stop while the camera floats the ISO for a proper brightness level. If the background is of mixed tonalities though, I recommend using full manual mode and setting everything yourself so the camera isn't fooled by like brighter or darker tonalities behind your subject. Also, mirrorless shooters, make sure your exposure is set properly and isn't too dark in the EVF there. The darker the image is in the viewfinder, the tougher it is for the AF system to lock on, and since this type of shooting is often done in dimmer light, this becomes even more critical than usual. Either way, you'll need some more specific settings to get you started, so let's take a look. Shutter speed. When it comes to slow shutter speed panning, the most critical setting is, unsurprisingly, shutter speed, since it controls both the amount of blur you see on the animal and the amount of streaking you see in the out-of-focus areas. The shutter speed you use is highly dependent on how fast the animal is moving and how far away it is from you. In fact, here are some very general shutter speed guidelines to get you started. Feel free to pause or even take a screenshot if you like. The values in red are for when the animal is at close range, and the blue shutter speeds are for when the subject is at a more typical distance for this kind of photography. The reason for the difference is simple. When an animal is close, you have to pan the camera faster to keep up with it over a given distance and at a given speed. For example, if a bird is flying past and moving 20 feet in three seconds, you'll swing the camera faster and farther at close range than you would if that same bird were farther away. As a side note, I often shoot a bit loser crop with slow shutter speed panning shots because I want to show enough of the environment to really convey that sense of motion. Finally, note that these shutter speeds are just a very general guideline. You may need more or less speed than shown depending on your specific situation. The biggest thing to remember about shutter speed isn't so much that you need to memorize specific values, but rather how it affects the environment around the subject, especially the background, and of course, how that speed makes the subject look. The slower the shutter speed, the more background streaking you're gonna see. However, the tougher it will be to get a recognizable face or eye. So if your background doesn't seem blurred or streaked enough, you wanna lower the shutter speed. However, if you just can't get an acceptable level of sharpness for your animal, especially in that face and eye area, then you may need to sacrifice some background blur for a faster shutter speed. I tend to quickly chimp when I can, so I can tweak this in the field based on the subject's speed and distance. And as you've probably guessed, when you first start out with slow shutter speed panning, ideally try to find a group of subjects that will give you multiple opportunities, not just a single one-off bird or mammal going by. Only with experience will you be able to quickly judge the animal's speed and choose a proper shutter speed for a one-time only shot. By the way, how sharp is sharp enough for your subject? 
First, I think it's important to set reasonable expectations here. For most of us, trying to get the same level of sharpness in a panning shot at 1 15th of a second that we see at 1 of a second just isn't realistic. For me, if I can get an easily recognizable face and eye, I'm pretty happy. Other photographers may want things a little bit sharper, still others are happy with just an impression of an animal. There's really no right or wrong since the intent of a photo like this is an impressionistic, artistic representation of the subject. However, I do have to say, there really is nothing quite like a slow shutter speed panning shot with a really sharp face and eye. They really tend to pop. F-stop. For slower shutter speed panning, F-stop helps compensate for brighter conditions and controls how the streaking in the background looks. The first and most obvious way we use F-stop with slow shutter speed panning is as a way to compensate for brighter light. Granted, most of the time we tend to do our slow shutter speed panning in dimmer conditions, but I know there have been more than a few times where I wanted to keep shooting at slower shutter speeds as the light kind of got brighter in the morning, or maybe I want to switch to slow shutter speed panning a little bit earlier in the evening. In those cases, it's often far too bright to shoot something like 1 15th or 1 8th of a second wide open even at base ISO. So in those brighter conditions, about the only place we have left to turn to get the exposure back under control is the aperture ring. The truth is, it's not unusual to find yourself at f16 or even f22 as conditions become brighter in the morning or when first starting out with slow shutter speed pans in the evening. In fact, in bright sunny conditions, even f22 won't be enough. That's why I usually reserve this type of shooting for the edges of day. By the way, if you can't get your shutter speed low enough, even at base ISO and F22, you might want to consider a neutral density filter. It can effectively help you drop multiple stops and allow for slow shutter speed panning, even in brighter conditions. As an additional side note, don't worry too much about diffraction if you have to stop down to something like F11, 16, or even 22. The truth is, panning shots typically aren't going to hold the same level of sharpness as faster shutter speed shots anyway, and a little softening from diffraction isn't going to make or break most photos, and for me personally, I know it's never been an issue. The other thing f-stop does is determine how distinct your streaks are in the background. With the lens wide open, you'll see a much smoother, non-distinct rendering of your background elements, and any streaking you see will have a much softer feel to it. On the other hand, stopping down makes the background streaking far more pronounced, and depending on your intention with the image, that might be exactly what you want. I know I like the effect myself, since an overly soft background doesn't always imply enough motion in the image. Also, keep in mind that distance plays a major role here as well. Closer backgrounds will always show fairly distinct streaking regardless of the f-stop, although still a little bit more streaking when stopped down. Where streak control comes more into play is when you have a more distant background. In those cases, stopping down will make a more pronounced difference. ISO. For this type of wildlife photography, ISO is seldom an issue since our shutter speeds are so low. However, if you are working in either really dim or really bright light, you do need to keep a careful eye on where your current shutter speed and f-stop combination is putting your ISO value. Here's how to handle both of those scenarios. First, in brighter conditions, watch for the bottom of your ISO range. With an open lens and really slow shutter speeds, it's easy to require an ISO of 25 or even 12 for brighter scenes, which is a problem since most cameras have a base ISO of 100 or 64. So if you notice your camera is at base ISO as you're shooting, double check your exposure to make sure you're not bottomed out and overexposing everything. If you are, drop to a smaller aperture or add a neutral density filter to compensate. Second. In really dim scenes, ISO can certainly climb even at slower shutter speeds, so you do have to keep an eye on it and maybe open the lens all the way up when the ISO is starting to climb up there. As a side note, I've noticed that panning shots actually seem to take noise reduction better than other types of images since they tend to lack super, super fine detail. So if you are shooting in near dark conditions, you'll often find that noise reduction software still cleans up your panning shots really nice, even at ISOs that are maybe a little bit higher than you'd normally use. However, usually when it gets dark enough for ISO to be an issue at speeds like one tenth of a second when the lens is wide open, AF starts to struggle, so the game might be over anyway. VR and image stabilization. What about VR or image stabilization? My advice is to turn it on since it can give you an edge. For Nikon, I tend to use sport VR since the AF area seems to jump around the viewfinder a bit less than with normal VR. For Sony or Canon, turn your lens to mode two for side-to-side -side panning. 
With Nikon VR or Mode 2 in Canon or Sony, the camera will optimize the stabilization system for panning and correct for movement in the opposite direction of your pan. Typically, that's going to be the vertical direction, the up and down motion. AF settings. First, you'll want AFC, servo AF for Canon, since you want the camera to continuously adjust focus as you pan along with the subject. Even with the subject moving parallel to your position, there will be minor changes in distance. The AF areas I tend to use for panning vary by camera, but all have one thing in common. They are non-tracking, non-moving AF areas. For example, on my Nikon mirrorless cameras, I'll use the wide small AF area or one of the smaller dynamic AF areas. On Sony, I like spot medium or sometimes spot large. On Canon, I'd look at the expanded spot AF area. Basically, you want an AF area that's a bit larger than a single or small spot AF area and that won't move around the viewfinder unless you move it. The idea then is simple. When tracking your subject, do your best to use your AF area as a bullseye and try to keep the target's eye right in the center of it as you pan. The key to a great panning shot is keeping the subject in the exact same place in the viewfinder and not allowing it to move from that position from shot to shot. Using an AF area to keep the eye of the subject in the same place, you know, as best you can, helps to maximize your keepers. Also, note that it's fine to use eye detection if it stays within the primary AF area for this kind of photography. By the way, note that eye detection and tracking are not always the same thing. You can have eye detection happening inside a static AF area and it can give you an edge with keeping the eye sharp. However, if eye detection can focus like far outside of the fixed AF area with your camera, sometimes it's better to shut eye detection off for panning to prevent false positives at the wrong location in the photo. Only use it if it's actually focusing on that face and eye area without any difficulty. Again, I really do want to stress that actual tracking areas are tougher. The problem is, if the AF area can move all over the screen, such as with Nikon's 3D tracking or Sony's tracking mode, you lose the anchor that a fixed AF position area provides, and it makes it tougher to keep the subject in the same place in the frame, at least in my opinion. Tripod. Although it seems like slow shutter speed panning would be easier if you left the sticks at home, I've actually found the opposite to be true. Personally, I like using a tripod. I find it makes it easier to keep the vertical movement more controlled and my success rate seems a little bit higher with a tripod under my lens than without one. However, I'm also very comfortable with a tripod, so your mileage may vary a little bit depending on your tripod experience. Once again, though, I do have a couple of quick notes. First, it helps to level off the tripod before shooting, so as you pan from side to side, the horizon and your background streaks don't start to go off at a weird angle. Now, at normal shutter speeds, I'm not overly concerned if my tripod is perfectly level since I can adjust on the fly as I pan. However, with slow shutter speed panning, I find that sometimes my streaks can look a little odd if I'm rotating the camera as I pan to keep the horizon level, so I like having everything perfectly level at the start. Second, although most modern lenses support some sort of image stabilization for panning, what they can do is relatively limited. By using a level tripod, you can mostly eliminate blur from the vertical up and down plane and that increases your odds of success. However, note that I'm still using a mostly loose gimbal head. I still keep the vertical control of the gimbal head unlocked, although typically a touch tighter than normal. The thing is, many of my panning subjects are birds and since they seldom fly past at the same elevation each time, I do need the ability to adjust how high the lens is pointed. Keeping just a bit of tension on the vertical control allows me to adjust to the correct elevation without compromising too much vertical stability. Technique. So those are the tools. So now you need to simply put them into use. Slow shutter speed panning actually works just like regular panning, only you do need to try for higher precision since your shutter speeds are so much slower. If I'm hand holding, I lock my arms, head and neck into place and try to twist only at my waist and I try to do so as smoothly as possible, keeping the camera as level as I can as I move. If I'm on a tripod, I keep the head loose as described a moment ago and do my best to swing smoothly side to side. Also, regardless of how you're supporting the lens, I find it's helpful to focus on the subject and track it for just a moment before shooting to establish a proper panning speed for that particular target. If you start shooting right away, it's tougher to get yourself panning at the proper speed and the failure rate gets even higher than normal. Ideally, try to pick up the subject before you really want to start shooting to give yourself that moment or two to gauge and adapt to its speed. This is especially important if you're using a camera where there's a blackout between shots. Once you're ready to fire, just gently roll your shutter finger down onto the release. 
In addition, since we often do this type of photography in lower light, you'll sometimes find the camera has a tougher time locking on and will occasionally hunt for the target. One thing I always do when engaged in any kind of panning, slow shutter speed or otherwise, is to switch my focus limiter on. That way, if the camera starts to hunt, I won't have to go through the entire focus range and you get back on the target much sooner. Once you start shooting, do your best to keep the eye in the middle of the AF area and shoot continuously until you no longer like the position of the subject in the viewfinder or if you need to reset because the subject has gotten away from you a bit. Sometimes we need to take a moment to reset our panning speed during the pan. Also, don't be afraid to shoot a ton of shots since each one will have a slightly different look. Basically, as long as the animal looks good in your viewfinder and you're keeping it in position in the frame, fire away. So yeah, basically, this is one of those techniques that's kind of easy to learn but can take a lifetime to master. Final thoughts. So those are the basics, but I do want to leave you with one final thought. This is an advanced technique and it does take enormous amounts of practice to become proficient at it. And even then, the failure rate is way higher than most of us are used to. So don't feel discouraged if the first few times you go out, you aren't met by a card load of tech sharp eyeballs. It takes time to become proficient at slow shutter speed panning, but in my opinion, the results really are worth the effort. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out my educational materials too. I have a wide variety of both eBooks and video workshops loaded with countless tips, tricks, and advice, all designed to make you a better photographer. Each and every book and video is presented in a clear, easy to understand way that makes it simple for anyone to learn, no matter what their current skill level. Plus, any of it can be had for less than the price of a lunch date at McDonald's. Also, make sure to stop by the site and sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss one of these videos, an article, a workshop opportunity, or a special offer. Finally, if you enjoyed this video, remember to like, subscribe, and get notified. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.